Hi, everyone. Our next discussion concerns the lack of diversity and equity in film and TV music and how the industry can help to move forward. To shed some light on this, let's welcome composer and founder of the Composers Diversity Collective, Michael Abels. He's also won an ASCAP award this week for his score to us. Along with composer and president of the Alliance for Women Film Composers, Star Parodi. They're joined by ASCAP's Amanda Schaffner, who's on moderating duty today. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Crystal. Hi, Star. Hi, Michael. Hi, Amanda. Hi, Star. Thanks. Both for joining. This is going to be a great conversation. So thank you both for being here. Congratulations again, Michael, on your screen award. That's so exciting. Thank you. So I just wanted to start with a little bit of history about the, the two organizations that you guys are, are involved with. So um, Star, I know that the Alliance was started in 2014 and you came uh, to be the president last year. So I was wondering if you could give us a little bit of the history of, of what's kind of taken place for the Alliance during that time. Sure, um, it, it really started as kind of a seed in the idea of Laura Cartman's mind. Um, there was a, there was a study that came out of the San Diego State University uh, about women in film and television. And it came out that only 2% of women were scoring the top 250 films. And she was appalled by this number. And so she and a handful of, of uh, a small group of people kind of created a think tank and really wanted to create a directory, you know, somewhere that could be a resource for women film composers. Um, and well, women in media and television. And there weren't that many of us that knew each other because we were all so kind of isolated. And it was such a kind of a competitive field that, you know, we, we weren't, you know, we weren't all kind of like one, you know what I mean? As far as wanting to support each other, we were just all kind of working and maybe in a little bit of denial that this was happening, sure. you know? So anyway, uh, she, Miriam Cutler, Lolita Ritmanis, and Chandler Pauling were kind of the seed core group that came up with this idea. Um, she had an initial meeting at her house where there was just a few of us there. We had a little jam session and we nice. talked about kind of how to talk about even what was going on because um, we didn't even talk about those kind of things with each other. You know what I mean? Like we didn't, we never really wanted to be thought of as female composers. We just were kind of working, but um, but didn't know how to even address the problem and to find the language to address the problem. So in 2016, this really great concert happened. Um, yes. Really grand performances, which I think you were there. Right? And, yeah. Uh, so it was uh, 20, 20 of us uh, performed our pieces with a full symphonic orchestra and a choir. And it was really powerful because it created a visual of women scoring, you know, and, and, you know, it was thousands of people came and it was really exciting. And I feel like that really kicked off things for us. So there's been a lot of, a lot of work behind the scenes. Laura Cartman was the first president. Lolita was the second. Yes. I'm third. And, um, there's been a lot of advocacy, a lot of professional development, um, career development, um, community building as we grow and learn about each other and each other's stories, how to support each other, you know, in our in our creative endeavors and in our lives as women, some as mothers, you know, and you know, just just kind of um, <clears throat> we just have been kind of building, uh, working a lot behind the scenes um, sure. with studio executives and, you know, letting them know how important it is to yep. have women's voices in film and TV and media. Yeah, that's funny because I think that there's a lot of parallels to the story of the Alliance starting and the story of the CDC starting. And so, Michael, I, I've heard you have an origin rumor that goes around that the the Composers Diversity Collective, the idea kind of came to you at a Sundance party. And I wondered how much of that is true and really why was it important for you to kind of start to develop a space for composers of color? Well, you're right. There's a, there are a lot of similarities in the story that Star just told. And I, 
I remember a conversation at Sundance, but I also remember one before that. And there, it, there were a couple things happening. One was for me, um, when Get Out came out and was a, a box office success, um, I was suddenly thrust into the world of, of film composing in a way I hadn't been before and was, was suddenly very visible and starting to meet a lot of people at different events. And um, those of us, you know, composers of color, we sort of, we would see each other and be like, hey, you know, I see you, <laughs> you know, you're, you're, you're doing the work. And I would also hear from young composers who would, you know, DM me and say, you know, I, you're, uh, I, I see you, you know, and I see what you've done and it inspires me. Right. And so, and so whenever I would see other composers, of, you know, we would say, you know, we should hang out, like people always say. <laughs> and, and so I would have these conversations and we would all agree that we should hang out. Yeah. And then a couple of us just realized, you know, we, and I thought, particularly for myself, I thought because of Get Out, if I say, yes, let's hang out and here's the day and here's the time and here's the place, that, that, that you know, I, I was in a moment where people might respond to the email, you know? Yes. So we sent out an email and we did it only 10 days before the party, which any party planner would tell you, don't do that. Sure, but of course. <laughs> we were hoping for like 10, 15 people. We had 50. Wow, wow. And yeah, and that just, it just really showed that when there's a, when there's a need for something that the world, the, you know, just responds. And since then, that was about just a little over two years ago now. Yep. Um, and since then, we've, We've um, we've managed to on on the business side, or we've managed to get our five hundred one c three nonprofit status. So we're very you know happy about that because it's a a, a, a way to say you're legit. <laughs> but yes. that our really our our goal was always to that you know most people that I meet in the business believe in diversity, even yes. with, with only two percent of films at the time that star mentioned being scored by women like anyone would say that's a problem including the people who maybe who have been responsible for making that be the situation right but but people will say but it's a pipeline problem you know i don't I, we want to be diverse but we don't know people you know we don't know so in our organization we thought well our our goal is to fix the doorbell i mean yeah. no it's not you know if you're if if hollywood's going to fix the doorbell we're going to fix the pipeline. Yes. Be like, if you, if you really say you want to be diverse over here, here we are, you know, <laughs> we, we have the composers diversity collective.org website where producers and directors and people are interested in composers for media who are not from an expected background can go and, and learn of us and see our work and hear our work. And, yeah. and so that's one thing. And then the other side, we've become, really it just a great social network. I mean, now instead of seeing composers at events and going, oh, look, I see you, you know, now I know these people. And I know a yeah. lot of composers of background, of South Asian composers and Asian composers and Latinx composers I never would have known, even though I had a sense that they were out there. And uh, so, so those are the two primary things our organization has done and is doing, but also we're about, um, in that I didn't see someone, I mean, I, I, Quincy Jones was someone who I looked up to and, and was, had been a film composer among all the other things he had done. Um, yeah. but, and, but we're also, we're providing mentorship in a way that we want to be visible so that young people know that com composing is a, is a, um, is a profession that's open to them in, right. spite, of, in spite of how much representation they may see. Right. Space where they belong. It's it's a community that's going to open them, uh, you know, uh, welcome them with open arms. Precisely. I think that's a, such an important part that you guys have both touched on this idea of, of visibility um, through a directory or through kind of a tangible website. So that way you kind of you're, you're putting feet to the flames a little bit of saying, you know, here we are and it's organized for you and we're we're very easy to find. So what other excuse can you come up with? You're kind of uh, putting the pressure, I think, um, in a good way. Um, that that change, I think, uh, change can sometimes be slow, but I, that's what I think is really wonderful about the two organizations that you guys are representing is because you're you're helping to accelerate that change. Thank you.
Yeah, yeah. thank you. And, and you guys have both talked about now the, the gender and race studies that have kind of been coming uh, to the forefront, I think, both in, in kind of public discourse um, and also very much at the forefront of our industry. You know, you've got, you had mentioned the, the San Diego study, the USC has a study that they're doing every few years. You know, you've got UCLA's Hollywood Diversity Report that comes out. The Sundance Institute is really getting involved with this research as well. Um, how are you guys using those studies? Does it help in your awareness campaigns? Um, have you noticed that um, studio executives are quick to bring up those studies as well? Um, kind of how is that helping the awareness? Well, you know, I think it's really important that the studies are taking place just to give a just to give a framework for what's sure. going on because we don't really know, you know, we may in our circle see a lot of women working and then there's, you know, but then when the, when the top thumbs come out, we don't see many, you know, you're still um, at that two to 3%. Still there. You yeah. know, I think nobody wants to be a quota. Yes. You know what I mean? And there's a temptation that equality is just going to happen because right. people are getting more aware and are, are, you know, our lives are more diverse. As artists, we, we you know, embrace diversity, but it's really not going to happen without, you know, the, the work, kind of groundwork of organizations like Michael's and like the Alliance and like the stuff that you guys are doing, you know, um, when we have discussions about, you know, about how to have more diversity in, in the awards process. And, you know, it's, it's really important because um, I think that, and Michael, I don't know if, if this is, is true for you, but for women, you know, um, in order to get a job, you have to have credit from another, mm -hmm. job, right? And so it's always been like that. So, so if you don't have credits, basically, you know, of a big film, there's no chance of getting on one, but it's this catch 22 because you, you don't have the credit, so you can't get on one, which would give you the credit to get on one. Yes. And I think what these studies have done has made um, studio execs and producers, directors, more open to listening to music that they wouldn't normally listen to. And really, rather than just listening with their eyes on the yeah. credits, listening to different composers, embracing the stories of all these different really wonderful people who are entering the marketplace and really, you know, have something to say. And I, I feel like that's been a huge help. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Michael, you touched on mentorship already. So I, I wanted to jump into that because I, I know that that's a super important part of our industry. I know just in talking to younger composers, you know, day in and day out, um, you know, mentorship is kind of built into our industry um, almost in the way of, of a true apprenticeship. A lot of these younger composers are kind of coming up and getting that really quality, almost vocational experience underneath a more experienced composer. Um, and I wanted to know, uh, have you guys thought about mentorship programs? I know the Alliance, as sorry, you guys are, are have already launched one. Um, how does mentorship play a role in your organization? Well, we've, hmm, I'm figuring out an eloquent way to yeah. explain this. It, and, there, and there's one way in a, in partnering with existing composition um, programs at the university level, where yeah. um, where now because we have a go-to place, um, most universities and, and schools of music are interested in bringing diverse voices in, and all of us are very happy to go and talk to young people in a organized setting when that we're just invited, and I I do that. When I'm invited, you know, every time my schedule permits, either you know, either live or now via via the web, yeah. um, and that's something that people have to know how to find us in yes. order to be able to even schedule us to do things. Like that. So we've been able to do that. But then also within our organization, you know, we're those of us the more established um, composers are able to get to know younger composers in the organization. Um, you know, in a situation that's not about just like looking at their resume or go or, yeah. or trying to, you know, look for an assistant in a very um, formal way. Mm -hmm. and, and and even though, even though, you know, 
we're all searching for ways to be more diverse, the way that hiring works kind of relates to what Star was saying, like you need to have the credits in order to be, you know, you, it, you ultimately you have to, no one is going to hire someone that they don't feel is the right fit. And what do they mean by that? They have to feel comfortable with that person. Absolutely. And sometimes, sometimes that, I'll try to bring this back to mentorship, but, so, but you know, that can be a thing about whether you look like what they expect. And that's something that we, we all have to notice in ourselves and really question whether that's a valid, you know, way to judge someone's work. But on the other hand, it's that you have to have some kind of rapport with them. Mm, and so that, funny. right. And that is, I think, because, because doing the music for a media project is very stressful. Yes. And people have to know that at those stressful moments that you are going to be someone that they can trust to help bring the stress down, not bring it up. Right. And that is the thing that no organization, none of our organizations can make that connection for another composer. Agreed. The composer has to make that connection on him, you know, himself or herself. Um, all we can do is connect people more actively to the opportunities where those types of personal connections can happen. Yes. So exactly. how that relates to mentorship is it's similar from, for an, a more established composer hiring an assistant. Yes. It still needs to be somebody that you feel like is someone who can help you manage those challenging times and whose skill sets are complementary to or similar to your own, depending on how you work. And I know our organization provides us a chance to get to know each other and and outside of just this cue is due to this evening yes. <laughs> <laughs> to, figure, exactly. to figure out who we might work with and then also that means that because we have because we do have a personal connection that maybe has been enhanced by working together or or maybe is just enhanced by wow you know she's really great or he's really great it means if someone asks me hey who, you know who can you recommend i now have people i know i can recommend Yes. And so to other people in our organization. And so, um, and so I wouldn't have, and personally, I wouldn't have gotten that if the organization didn't exist. And I'm hoping that that's a feature that our organization provides to other composers, especially the younger one. Yeah, I love that. And that speaks kind of to what you were saying, Star, about it not being about a quota. If what you're doing is really providing an opportunity to delve deeper into more organic relationships, that's going to happen naturally. It's going to be an organic process that kind of unfolds, which I which I love. Um, but I, I do know I do want to mention that you guys did start a mentorship program, and I, I know 2020 has thrown us all for a loop. Um, but I wanted to check in and see how that mentorship process is going, and really what has been the feedback both from the mentees and the mentors. Well, I, you know, what Michael said, I loved. No drama. Yes. <laughs> Level down. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I think that is an important um, aspect of mentees and mentors working together. You know, and it's amazing in Michael's organization that you know so many artists are you know speaking to young people, and in ours we do the same. You know, there's many of us that go and and speak we're actually partners with the grammy music education coalition and you know do speak to a lot of of young women about careers in music um specifically our mentorship program was something that was really in the works something that we wanted to do but it was daunting because how do you how do you how do you pick somebody you know what i mean and everything music is so subjective and there's so much talent you know and I think that that we got about 70 applications. Wow. Um, I know it was crazy. We have a mentorship committee made up of three people, um, Steph Economou, Ronit Kirsch, and Nami Melumai. Nice. And they uh, they were kind of the core committee that put all the you know ideas together for how the program would be run. Uh, six people were chosen, and it was really hard to choose. Yes. And um, and some of the people that were chosen as mentees uh, were chosen because of who we knew we had as mentors. Like we would hear somebody real and say, you know, that would be a really great fit. Plus, we know them like what Michael was saying. They've been at all our meetings, you know, and um, we know how diligent they are and they've put their best forward. 
in, you know, wanting to be in this program. And so we have uh, six really talented, amazing mentees. And, you know, the program got started great. And then <laughs> a month later, you know, the pandemic hit. So right. everything's been taking place on Zoom and um, and on, you know, phone calls um, at no more personal meetings. But mm -hmm. I, I've heard that it's going really well. The mentors are feeling really, you know, comfortable with the mentees. Some mentors are even getting together more than required, you know, and there have been helps with putting together rules, um, suggestions on cues and all kinds of stuff. So it's a six month program. Oh, nice. and, um, so our next one is going to start in January of, you know, just because of all the craziness going on. But it's something that we're really super proud of because it's definitely part of the mission statement, you know, of the alliance to support to support education and like what Michael was saying about um, creating these um, these these associations and and alliances with established composers, you know, so that they could maybe say, "Hey, I could recommend this person. I know their work." You yeah. Know? It's a program that you guys should be really proud of. Obviously, we've heard you guys talking about um, being hopeful that it would come about for so many years now. And, and it really is um, a beautiful way to, again, uh, develop those really organic relationships. Um, so bravo to you guys. I'm very happy to hear that it's going well. Um, and, and on the subject of 2020 being um, throwing us all for a bit of, the, of a loop, uh, I wanted to ask, what did you guys enter into 2020 kind of hoping to do with your organizations and how have you had to adapt? Are you, have you been able to move everything virtual? Did you um, have to adapt some of your goals for the year? Um. <laughs> <laughs> Who should go? You just star. You just spoke really eloquently. You're. It sounds like I'm. I mean, offline, I should hear more about how you guys did your mentorship program actively because it sounds beautiful. Um, about so about 2020, we managed. We you know our nonprofit status was a goal which we managed to make in spite of Corona. Um, I really thank. Um, really thank our members for making that happen One of our key executive committee members kept pushing that forward um, nice. we used to have a pretty much monthly mixer where we just all got together and those have stopped since january that we've not had any in person so sure. we did manage to have our first virtual one nice. was i was really terrific a huge success and we're planning our next one to do that way. And so um, in the short term, those are the ways that it's it's been impacted. But we, you know, we all, when the shutdown happened, we all were trying to figure out our own lives as much as the rest of the world was. And now we're all getting our sea legs in terms of what that looks like. And so yeah. we're able to get back to doing what we were doing. Yeah. And with the five, I, I wanted to ask and, and um, you guys, or maybe highlight, um, one of the things that I love about this year is that you guys now can accept donations at the CDC, that people in our community can actively financially support you. Yes. I think that's huge. I, thank you. <laughs> people can uh, do that at our website, which is composersdiversitycollective.org. Diver, composers Perfect. And Star, what about you guys? How have you had to adapt to 2020's challenges? Well, I was going to say to Michael, that's so cool that you guys got nonprofit status. And um, and we also have been working on that and and finally got it as well. Um, and, yeah, just, it's like, oh my gosh, you know, the, the paperwork and all to, you know, so much thanks to, to Thomas McHugh, who just like, just pulled that together in a crazy way. Um, but, you know, we were actually going to do something together, the CDC and the AWFC. We had a mixer plan that we were really excited about. We had a couple of collaborations with New Filmmakers LA. We had a, a collaboration with the Alliance of Women Directors, all canceled. <laughs> you know, it's like we were all kind of thrown for a loop. And we're now kind of getting our sea legs. Yep. One really great thing that's come out of this that i think we're gonna well we're not i think we're definitely going to continue 
is we've been having these um, weekly hangouts mm -hmm. um, on Zoom, and a different board member has been hosting each one. Some have been um, focused on professional development, or like Miriam Cutler did one on documentaries. Some have been focused, one was focused on motherhood. One was, um, one was just a happy hour where we hung out. And one thing that I've heard since our membership has really grown from our little 15 people to we now have over like 550 members in, and oh. you know, yeah, we, we've just started a UK um, chapter. Uh, our new board member, Jenna Fentiman, has been doing amazing work there. And we have a bunch of members in Australia and kind of all over. And what people have been saying, you know, is, hey, when you have these really cool events in L.A., we never get to come, you yeah, know. And so our directory is, you know, our kind of shining star of, you know, of, of being a member of the Alliance. But nobody was able to come that if they lived in Colorado or Kansas or, you know, so these Zoom meetings every week have been yeah. great because people show up from everywhere yeah. and we really want to keep that going because it's just been an amazing way to continue the community and just, it's been awesome. That's great. Well, actually on that note, um, I've been seeing some of the questions that everyone has been uh, putting through and a lot of them are on that subject. Um, young composers who are maybe just finding out about your organizations for the very first time during this talk um, and they want to get involved. So I wondered if you guys had any advice about, you know, is, is there a certain meeting that they should show up at first? Is the mentorship program something they should think about? Um, what's the best way to kind of get your feet wet? Um, for our organization, it, <laughs> I, no, before COVID, I would have said, come to one of our mixers. Yep. And now I think you would have to first go to our website and register or join a, at a at a very basic level so that you could be a part of the Zoom mixer. And yes. only just because we um, we managed to have one Zoom. So we're still we haven't come up with a um, ongoing way of doing that. We're just we're only up to that level yet. So that's how you, but through the website right now is the best way to get involved with us. Perfect. And and same, you know, as Michael, if you go to our website, which is the awfc.com, um, you can read more about us, you can join. And, you know, and again, there's it's not that expensive to join. And if you're a student, it's a very basic thing to join. Um, if you're not a composer, but you'd like to be supportive and join, you know, you can join as a sponsor. And um, and then if you just want to, you know, reach out to us with ideas. I mean, if you're a, if you're, you know, a film or, you know, studio executive, um, please check out our, um, our directory, you know, use it as a resource. There's so many great composers there. And, you know, but just like Michael, the, I think until this pandemic is over, which hopefully, hopefully will be soon. Yes. Um, you know, we have Zoom meetings and, you know, and people who really will talk to, to whoever reaches out to us. Yeah, and very active social media for both of you. I have to give you huge props because I am learning now that it's very difficult to start a social media channel. So bravo to you. So yes, get connected with all of us. We would love to hear from you. Mm -hmm.